Tassa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhassa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhassa Buddhang Dhammang Sanggang Namasami So congratulations to all of us who've made it this far in the day. Uh, we'll all now hopefully get to experience the joy of not missing out. That is the joy of getting to hear about the last two of the attachments or the uh, ways that we attach and cling on to things. Um, so just to test, uh, see where everybody is at. Um, does anybody remember the first form of ubadana or clinging attachment that Ayasoma talked about? You get extra points for the poly. If you can do the poly. <laughs> Anybody? You can. Pleasures. Sense pleasures. Nice. And did you get the poly as well? No. That's okay. That's okay. Anybody for the poly? Kama. Kama. That's uh, sensuality. So attaching and clinging to sensuality, that's the first form of attachment, which the Buddha said will lead to suffering. Uh, the second one, which Bhante Sudasso spoke about, was anybody? Self-view. Self yep. View of self. And the Pali for that is Atavadu Padana. That's right. Yep. Uh, so the next type of uh, attaching or clinging, which, will, which the Buddha talked about, was clinging and attaching and just grasping on to views and uh, this is something which is quite fascinating to to look at uh, because it's something which you this is the practice of letting go of of views or attachment to views is really something which we do in daily life so oftentimes people will say how do i bring the dhamma how do i bring buddhism how do i bring my practice into my daily life and this watching and observing your attachment to the things that you believe strongly, your attachment to that, watching that throughout the day, and then letting go when you realize that it's causing suffering for you or the people around you. That's a daily life practice. You can see your attachment to views as you're sitting down with eyes closed or walking back and forth, uh, but it's something which just kind of screams out. The more you get used to it and the more you notice it in yourself and others, then the more it just, uh, yeah, becomes that much more it's, it's almost like um, you know, a, a magnet. You, know, you put two magnet poles against one another and they just have this uh, kind of disattractive, they're kind of pushing each other away. And uh, similarly, once you see the attachment to views within yourself and then see it in the world around you, it's almost like your moral sense starts to just like, just to push away. You're, you're no longer uh, kind of attracted to that. You're also, you're repelled by, uh, by seeing that, that kind of graspiness. Um, so it's, it's quite fascinating. I mean, we live in an American culture which just praises and celebrates um, having a view and having an opinion. Basically, that's so much of what college is about, is about you going and learning how to have an opinion about something. And then the more passionate you are about that, then kind of the more social credit you can get in certain circles. And just to say from the beginning, there's nothing wrong with, with having views. Actually, right view, it's the same word. Right view is part of the, the Buddhist path. Right view is the first factor of the Eightfold Path. Um, so having views is, it's a part of the Buddhist path, and it's something which we can't really get around. Like everybody, whether you're conscious of the views that you're holding or you're not conscious of them and they're just kind of underneath the ground uh, influencing everything you say and do and, and think. Um, we all have these, these views and it, it's good to become more and more cognizant of what your views are. And if you are finding benefit in the teachings of the Buddha um, and thinking, oh, you know, I'm getting some benefit from this meditation and the Buddha's teachings on right speech and What's this thing about right view? Maybe, 
maybe there's, there's something there and paying attention because the Buddha did say that, um, yeah, there, is, there are certain ways of thinking, certain ways of seeing the world which are more accurate uh, than other ways of seeing. So uh, in Western philosophy, the study of the truth and our understanding of what's true and what's false is called epistemology. And a unique thing about Buddhist epistemology, Buddhist study and belief about what's true and what's false, one aspect of it which is fascinating is exactly what the Buddha says are true and false. But equally important is the way that we hold on to, the way that we grasp that which the Buddha said is, is, is true or is false. And if we're, so <laughs> when the Buddha was asked to define what is uh, right view, uh, he says there's two ways that he kind of answers that, but uh, the main way is knowing these Four Noble Truths. So there is suffering, there is suffering in our experience. There is a cause of suffering, there's a cessation of suffering, and there's a path leading to the cessation of suffering. That's right view in a, a Buddhist context. But even if we believe those things, it will cause us dukkha if we grasp and squeeze and hold on to those things. And this is a, a stock phrase, or a yeah, stock phrase which you find again and again in the canon is only this is true and everything else is false. And that is when we make problems for ourselves, is when we have this holding on to our view, whether it's a Buddhist view or a secular view or a political view or whatever kind of view it is, uh, it's when we hold on to it, only this is true and everything else is false. And why is that problematic? Is because not everybody believes the same thing that we believe and it can cause trouble for us because everybody else is going around and they don't, other people for the most part don't realize when they're holding on to their views. And if we're like, you know, bear hugging our views and they're bug bear hugging their views, it's basically just like the bumper cars, you know, we just run into one another and there's no place for, for hearing, um, hearing one another. Um, so it's important in a Buddhist context, both to examine, okay, the Buddha said that there is suffering, there's a cause of suffering, there's a cessation, there's an ending, ending of suffering, and there's a path. Um, that's the very, that's a Theravada, so like the Southern Buddhist definition of right view. Um, currently, I'm attending a Mahayana, or a Chinese Buddhist university, and I've found it, you know, pretty non-triggering yeah, I feel, for the most part, I'm a fairly non-trigger-having person. I don't like having triggers, and I don't really, like, have that many. But, you know, I was fine. You know, we have Western Classics classes. I'm reading the Bible. It's great. I'm loving it. You know, reading the Stoics. They're great. We're going to read the Quran. All right. Great stuff. But we start reading these Mahayana, these Chinese Buddhist texts. And I'm like, uh-uh. No, no. And it's this, we've mentioned this before, but like this narcissism of small differences or, you know, these small little tweaks of uh, opinion. So in the Maha Prajnaparamita Sutra, basically the Heart Sutra, this is a sutra which people in every Mahayana Buddhist country in uh, Japan, China, Korea, uh, Vietnam, they'll chant this, it takes about a minute and they just chant it, sometimes people use it as a mantra, and part of that is there is no suffering, there is no cause of suffering, there is no cessation of suffering, and there is no path. And I'm just like, that is not true. <laughs> that is like the exact opposite of what is true. Your Buddha is not right. Your, you know, this Mahayana Buddhist is like, no, somebody just, you know, later monks just made that up, and it's like, it was very difficult and it was very painful. And um, yeah, and that was the most valuable class that I had really, like sitting through and just watching that pain. And it was painful because I don't like, I, you know, I don't like seeing other people attached to their views and kind of scream them, however politely, at other people. And I don't like when I do it. So I could see these words coming out of my mouth like, you made up those suttas. You know, or it's not really Buddha Dhamma. You know, it, fortunately, I don't think I was ever 
so like ridiculous as to say something like that, but uh, I certainly had those thoughts and uh, it's painful and uh, I didn't need to say that. I don't, and fortunately I didn't, but that's, that's what it is, this, this holding on to, to views and it's, it causes trouble, it causes a little bit of trouble because it's almost like with that, with that visor on of only this is true, everything else is false, even if I don't say those specific words of you made up, you know, those are fake sutras, you know, just thinking that, you know, and, and fortunately I've reconciled with, and I love that discourse actually, um, but with that visor on of only my view is true, everything else is false, basically anything that I say almost like spews out, it like spews out the side of my mouth, like steam, it's like bordering on anger or bordering on aversion and uh, that's how we conflict with each other in our daily lives. You know, my, my mom and dad, they've got what I like to call dishwasher dukkha. Yeah, so dukkha is suffering and they've got dishwasher dukkha. Each of them have their own way of loading the dishwasher. Yeah, and my stepdad likes to put the forks and the spoons like face up in that little tray. And my mom says, no, 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 it's face down. Yeah, <laughs> and they each have their reasons. And it sucks for each of them, like every time, you know, they, so basically they've got, it's, you know, a two-part, you know, holder, so they each have half a holder for <laughs> the way they stick their spoons. Um, and that's like the silliness, and, and it's great to be able to see that silliness, but we don't see it when it's in our, when it's us. Like it's when we, and unfortunately, the things that we grasp onto are often the things we care about most. So we've got this view that, this is true, and it's, it can be so easy for us to be triggered at those times, yeah? Like, we've got these trigger words, and we set up this minefield, yeah? So someone says the wrong word, they don't like, you know, they say a word that we don't like, or they bring up a concept, like, or we even get a flavor that they believe something that we don't. Like, they say something which seems vaguely, you know, anti-vax, or something which is very pro-vaccination, and we're on the either side of that or they say something about you know, a five-letter politician that we don't like, and we kind of just tweak, and it's like the, the weapon systems have been set. The minefield is ready, and the next thing they say, you know, we're just like ready you know, for the, the, our own like mind. You know, we've set up this idea of this is my view. We have these minds set around, and they say the next thing like, they say ivermectin, boom, or they say, Masks, boom, and it's, and it's painful. And, uh, but what's fascinating is that it's not painful if you don't care about that, or even if you do care about the thing. I'm not advocating, and the Buddha didn't advocate that we don't care about, and we don't try to see the world accurately. We do try to see the world accurately, and we do care, and we do, there's a place for passion, and for energy, and desire, and interest on the path. Uh, but it's the way that we relate to that, that passion for what's, for what's true, this Dhamma Chanda. Um, and yeah, if it's an issue that, yeah, I don't really care which way you put the spoons in, you know, tell me to put the spoons in one way and I'll do it that way. And um, when you can see the, the silliness of it, or it's like the squirrels don't care, you know, who gets elected president next, or children largely don't care who is making the COVID policies or whatever it is, or you know, the, the huge issues that are on the docket uh, in the, on the political horizon. And yeah, again, care about that which you know, should be changed in the world, but um, we become less possible vehicles, less effective vehicles for positive change when we're so attached to our views, because it's so annoying, yeah? It's so annoying when other people are attached to their views and when we're attached to ours, there's just no hearing that's going on. And it's almost just like, you know, just uh, there's no point, you know, in, in the dialogue when we're coming from this, this kind of attachment. So that's uh, attaching to views. And you can, you can feel this in yourself. You can feel when the weapon system gets triggered or when the green visor goes over our eyes and or when it's like you know one of those kitchen timers almost like they say the triggering word and it's almost like and we've got like 
it'll be five minutes before we're able to see the world clearly again because we're so uh, tweaked and on the edge of our seat and ready to be realized that this person is an ignorant whatever. Um, so don't do that. Don't be attached to your views, um, even your right views and even your true views. Ajahn Chah was a genius about this. He said that our views can be true, but not right. They can be right, but not true. Tu, that might jing, jing, that might tu. True, but not right, right, but not true. And that's, what that's pointing to is how we're holding on to these things. And it's so important because we want to be able to hear each other and it, and it sucks because we do it with the people we love the most and um, we do it with the people we hate the most. And when we do it with the people we hate the most, it just causes more and more separation. And when we do it with the people we love the most, it does the same. So the next type of uh, attachment is also very um, useful to consider. And a similar kind of paradox, uh, it's called uh, attachment to rites and rituals, or attachment to habits and practices, or attachment to virtue and wholesome habits. So the word is sila, sila bata paramasa. Sila, as some people will know, means virtue, and it's part of the path. So right speech, right action, right livelihood, these all fall under sila, of virtue. And uh, the Buddha said, yeah, we should all be practicing sila, all be becoming more and more ethical people, refraining from killing, stealing, lying, sexual misconduct, and uh, intoxicants. So there is a place for morality on the path, a huge place. It's a foundation, as we talked about before. Uh, and vata is similarly like our good habits our good exercise regimes, our dietary habits, you know, <laughs> all these things which we hold on to and which are healthy for us and healthy for the world um, on the positive end of the spectrum. And then paramasa means masa. Mas is, means to like to touch or to massage. Pari is all around and a ah is like an intensifier. So it's like you're, you're holding these virtue and practices, these habits and practices all around. So you're basically attaching to these things in an inappropriate and unhelpful, unhelpful way. So just as Buddhist epistemology is more than just knowing what's true and false. Similarly, Buddhist ethics is more than just knowing what's right and wrong or practicing what's good and bad uh, or practicing what's good and refraining from what's bad. It's also about not creating a self out of that. Yeah, so it's not, so someone might not kill, not steal, not lie, not commit sexual misconduct, great study habits, great exercise program, great diet, but still you hold on to that and like use it, you know, you're just in a way which you think that this is the path to salvation. And if I just get my habits together, then I'll be enlightened. If I just, um, you know, meditation can fall under this rubric of a, of a wholesome habit. If I just get the right meditation technique, if I just meditate for the right amount of time every day, then I won't suffer. That's the path to, uh, to liberation. And when you hold on to that um, in a, an inappropriate or an unskilled way, um, it's gonna cause us suffering. So the paradox here, or the skill here, is about, uh, yes, like hold on to your precepts, hold on to your good habits, yeah? Especially if the reverse is going to be hell, basically. If I'm an alcoholic, if I'm quitting smoking, quitting whatever, and I've got a serious addiction, it is a very smart thing for me to hold on very, very tightly to my abstinence or my uh, sobriety. I'm not going. I'm not going to drink that, you know. And uh, because the consequences are dire for us. Um, and the skill here is holding on, but uh, yeah, not not doing it in a way which causes suffering. 
for, for ourselves and the people around us. And you need to hold on just the right amount. Like the Buddha gives a simile, he's talking about meditation. You wanna hold your meditation object like a baby bird, like a baby bird. You wanna hold it just the right tightness, yeah, so it doesn't fall out of your hands, fall onto the ground and get hurt. But you don't wanna be too tight, or too loose, or else it's just, you know, I'm sorry, if you squeeze too tightly, then you might crush the bird. But if you open your hands up too much, then the bird's gonna escape. And it's similarly here with morality and the precepts that we keep. It's, you wanna hold just the right tightness, but not too tight, yeah? Because when we hold on to our, um, <laughs> our dietary preferences, our morality, and start taking this, uh, start lifting ourselves up and disparaging others. This is another stock phrase uh, in the Buddhist canon. When you start lifting yourself up and disparaging others, that sucks, and it's not a smart way to practice morality. Um, so we, get, we have to learn how to be skillful with that. You know, do the right thing. Keep the right practices. Do the best you can in everything you, you do, but um, don't do it in a way which is self-aggrandizing and self-making and other destroying. Um, so it takes, it takes uh, some finesse here. So it's quite interesting when you come to a monastery, many people think of uh, a monastery as a place where sensuality, we're giving up sensuality, they're kind of maybe in your imagination like dark place. We don't eat afternoon, there's no sexuality, there's darkness and no movies and no Netflix and <laughs> no YouTube and all these, it's a very sensual no, you know, crush the sensuality. And we do do all those things, but uh, on, we do have to eat, yeah? We're going, <laughs> there's a place for eating on the path, yeah? It's not, we don't starve ourselves into enlightenment. Um, so at many monasteries, at healthy training monasteries, many of the senior monks, if a monk, if a junior monk um, eats too much, which is oftentimes the norm, or at least, uh, you know, a very common occurrence, and they hate themselves. I became a monk and I just ate too much sticky rice and mango, so good. And they hate themselves and they basically just, you know, the senior monk doesn't say, yeah, that's right, you're bad. You know, it's, <laughs> it's like, that's a place you're training. We're here, we're all training together. And more what's emphasized are these view-based and um, how-based questions. So, um, yeah, how, do, how are we holding on to our opinions about the path? How are we holding on to our views about, about Buddhism? Um, and that's something which senior monks will often be uh, much more kind of, they'll come down with, you know, come down with a fairly strict admonition on junior monks if, you know, we're holding on to this, you know, denigrating some other sect or, uh, you know, speaking self-righteously about our, our practices or whatnot, the senior monks would be like, no, that's, that's ridiculous, or like squabbling over petty, petty views about things. The senior monks would be like, no, there's, there's no place for that. You know, this, this, is a, this monastery is a place of, of harmony. And when you come down on other people for their views, you're creating a, an environment which is antithetical to growth in the Dhamma. This is a long game. And that mirrors, that paying more attention to views, mirrors how these things are abandoned on the path to full enlightenment. So for people who are somewhat familiar with Theravada Buddhism, there are four levels of attainment. That's right, attainment. So, and these are things which, um, once you reach this level of attainment, there's no going back. It's, you've reached the stage of spiritual uh, health and spiritual plenitude, that there's no regress, yeah? And that first stage is called Sotapanna, or stream entry. Then you've got, uh, once returner, non returner, and an arhat or a fully enlightened Buddha. And the factor of sensuality, our attachment to sensuality, that is only let go at the third level of enlightenment. Yeah. So this this takes time. 
Yeah, this takes time. Even people who are stream enters, first level enlightenment, never gonna go back, never gonna regress in certain aspects. Still, they might eat too many Snickers at the meal, or um, they might do whatever kind of other sensual indulgence. They have not yet transcended that, uh, that lustful, that lusting drive. Uh, and similarly, with Atavadu Badana, the attachment or the clinging to self view, that's only let go at the fourth level of enlightenment, the full arhatship. So that takes a long time. But these two, which we were just talking about, it's the attachment to ditti or views, attachment to our opinions, that's, that's let go of at the first level of enlightenment, at sotapanna. Uh, basically, when we get rid of doubt, yeah, when we become established in the Dhamma, when we have no more doubt in the Dhamma, then there's no clinging on to views anymore because we see the way things are, we know what's true, and if somebody else has some other opinion, if they say there is no dukkha or whatever, it's like, I don't care. You know, he can say that, she can say that, and it's just like not a problem. You know, I've, one is established in non, non-doubt. And similarly with this uh, letting go of the attachment to rites and rituals, precepts and pra- practices, that's let go at the first level of enlightenment as well. So Sotapanas, these stream enters, people who've uh, realized the first level of enlightenment, um, they're just naturally virtuous and um, they're not going to transgress and they're not going to make a problem out of it and they're not going to hate you for whatever your practice is or your non-practice or your abstinence or your non-abstinence and they're firmly established in uh, in the practice and they it's just a natural a natural sila a natural uh, moral sense which has become internalized um, so we can practice towards that and uh, so be kind with yourself uh, as we all let go of all of these types of uh, attachment because they just cause us suffering and but just realize you know it's so easy to um, you know centrally indulge because we live in a sensual world uh, but be kind with yourself because that's hard to to let go and pay attention when you're getting into strife with your your partner or your mother or your family or your brother or your fellow monk or your fellow whatever because um, that's that's antithetical to the path so um, and see yeah this is a practice these are practices you can do in daily life and there are also practices you can do in meditation I mean just uh, to test yourself yeah, you th- might think well, I'm not attached to views and then just bring up the face of the opposing five-letter politician or you know, bring up the opposing view, like, actually, no, you know, it's the best diet is a carnivorous diet, you know, where all you eat is meat. You know, that's, and yeah, just think, just watch how your mind relates to that and see if you can uh, calm around it and do what's right, but not uh, make a self out of it. So we'll leave that there.